The Arabian horse has many distinct characteristics, not the least of which are, they are playful, they are very proud, they are powerful, they are speedy, and they are very elegant. There are many myths and theories concerning the origin of a unique breed of horse. Somewhere in the inhospitable deserts of the Middle East, centuries ago, in the sweet grass oases along the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, in the countries that are now known to us as Syria, Iraq, and Iran, and in other parts of the Arabian Peninsula, this hardy horse developed and would be known as the Arabian horse. The Arabian horse is said to be the oldest of all purebred horses. They have played a role in the history of both man and horse. To the Islamic people, he was considered a gift from Allah. Long before Europeans were to become aware of his existence, the horse of the desert had established himself as a necessity for the survival of the Bedouin people. The headmen of the tribes could relate the verbal histories of each family of horse in his tribe. This recital of lineage enabled the breeding of the finest combination of horses and the nurturing of the purity of the breed. The mythology and romance of the breed grew in passing centuries as stories of courage, endurance, and wealth were intermingled with genealogies. Due in part to the religious significance attached to the Arabian horse, as well as the contribution it made to the wealth and security of the tribe, the breed flourished in near isolation, ensuring its purity. The very nature of the breed, its shape as well as color, was influenced by religious beliefs, superstition, and tradition. The Arabian horse has several characteristics that set it apart from other breeds. They have a noticeable short head with a wide set forehead. The prominent eyes are set wide. The face of the Arabian horse is dished as opposed to the straight face or Roman nose of other breeds. The wide jowls of the head taper down to a small muzzle where the large nostrils are set. The neck is long and arching from the connection at the withers tapering to a fine throat latch where it attaches to the head. The back is short, two vertebrae less at the lumbar area than typical horses. This accounts for the showy high tail carriage. The short back has a wide sprung rib cage that gives it a lung capacity 15% larger than typical horses of the same size. The acclimation to desert life with the large nostrils to deliver air to the extra lung capacity gave it a reputation for endurance and speed. The Arabian was primarily a war instrument, as were most horses in societies of the time. A well-mounted Bedouin could attack an enemy tribe and capture their herds of sheep, camels, and goats, adding to the wealth of their own tribe. Speed and endurance were essential, for the raids were often carried out far from the home camp. Races were held periodically. The winner of the races would select the best of the losers herd as their prize. Breeding stock could be bought and sold, but as a rule the mares carried no price. If indeed they changed hands, it would be as a most honored gift. Each tribe nurtured a certain strain of horses based on family of the mares. Five basic families of the Arabian horses provided the foundation of today's bloodlines. Europe had developed large horses to carry knights with armor. They had nothing to compare with the small, fast horses upon which the invaders were mounted. An interest in these horses developed as swords and spears were replaced with guns and rifles. Today, 90% of all thoroughbreds can trace their lineage to three main stallions imported from the Arabian horses of the Ottoman Empire. Napoleon rode an Arabian horse, as did our George Washington. America was built by utilizing horsepower. Colonialists were quick to realize the value of the Arabian bloodstock. Breeding these horses is still parts luck, art, and good common sense. The first step is to have mares that are of good bloodstock and with the characteristics the breeder wants carried on to the foals. Although the stallions get most of the glory in the show ring, the fact is the foal derives most of its characteristics from the mare. It is why the Bedouins depended so much on the mares to follow the family bloodlines. Once you have selected the mares, 
Then the guests and artwork comes in finding a stallion with which to breed them. On our ranch, we chose two stallions for breeding. The first is Om El Shaman. He is from the Egyptian bloodlines on the sire side and Spanish bloodlines on the dom side. He stands at stud at Om El Arab Ranch in Santa Ynez, California. The second from the same ranch, we selected Dreamcatcher. This handsome black stallion was solicited by Disney Film Studios for the Cinema Max film of the Black Stallion. He is a descendant from some very famous bloodlines in the Arabian horse world. Breeding is often done by artificial insemination. When breeding is done live, there are precautions to be followed. Even though the mare exhibits signs of being in heat, she is held behind the wall and the stallion is introduced. This process is called teasing. If the mare shows signs of willingness, then she is brought out to the stallion for mating. If she's not ready, then you try another day. Once the mating is complete, ultrasound inspection is a procedure used to verify if a viable follic was present and impregnated. In 30 days, you can hear the first heartbeat of the foal. Then you are on your way to the 11 month gestation period for the typical horse to be born. The mare will start lactation a couple of days before she is ready to give birth. She will be very nervous and pacing as well as laying down and standing up on the day that the baby is due. Finally, she will start sweating and her water will break. From there, it is the individual mare and the size of the foal that makes birth easy or difficult. If there are no complications, the foal's front feet will come out and then the head squeezed in between the front legs will show. Nature has provided that the hooves are made of a gelatin-like material so as to not damage the birth canal. Once the shoulder's clear, then the rest of the foal comes out rapidly. About 30 minutes after birth, the hooves will become the hard horn material, same as that of a mature horse. The foal will try and get up after only a few minutes. In the wild, it is imperative for the young ones to be ready to get up and run for survival. The mare will often eat the afterbirth to try and to get rid of the odor that might alert a predator that a young vulnerable horse is near. It is believed that if you handle the foal as soon as it is born, touching its head and body and tapping on its feet, it will yield to your touch as it grows and make it much easier to train and work with the horse. This procedure is called imprinting. The process of standing has its anxious moments and is both comical and heartrending. There are many false starts as the foal tries to gain footing and to get its long legs into proper position. Sometimes in the process, both mother and baby tire out and decide to take a break from the struggle. Usually after about 30 minutes of hard work and in total defiance of the force of gravity, the skin and bone body gets balanced on long thin legs. They look unsteady but they manage to stay aloft. Okay. Long before the foal is steady on its feet, the hunt for milk begins. It will blunder from stem to stern looking for the milk source. At this early stage, it can only see bright and dark. The eyes cannot see anything discernible until several hours after birth. It is important for the foal to drink the first of the milk from the mare as it contains colostrum, which is loaded with nutrients and antibodies essential for the health of the foal in the first few days. In the next few hours and days that follow, the change is almost miraculous as the baby gains strength with unbelievable speed. The foal shown here after a few hours and then a few days demonstrates this development. His second day in the world, Rajal is in the arena with his mom, Farasha. As you can see, he stays pretty close to her side, which they're prone to do for the first few weeks. 
It's hard to believe this is the unsteady colt that was having such a tough time standing up for the first few minutes of his life. Here Shandru is with his mom, E.C. Nadine. Shandru has taken exception to a fly going by in his space and he starts chasing it. We don't know whether he was trying to catch it or imitate it, but as you can see, flap his wings as he might, he was not successful in staying aloft. Four weeks later, Rajel is quite a big colt. As you can see, his neck's still not long enough to reach the ground, so he stretches his legs like a giraffe might, although his neck will grow longer in proportion to his height. These beautiful creatures entertain us from their movements and antics running around full of life and so proud of everything they do. At six weeks old, our filly Melita, for the first time, sees me on her mother's back and as you can see she's got quite a high prancing walk and she's very excited at this change that she sees in her mother. These horses seem to be genetically predisposed to being on parade at all times. They never miss a chance to show off and their pride shows in all their movements. We don't know if little Melita knew we are looking at her, but it sure seems that way. At six weeks old, the colts are more rambunctious than the fillies. Here, you can see that Shundru is ready to be the center of attention. The athleticism of these young foals is amazing when you consider that he's thundering across our pasture which is full of rocks, holes, and high grass. wants to make sure mom is looking before he takes off again. It is hard to imagine that in three short years the foal will be big enough to be trained under saddle, although he will not be fully developed until around age five or six years. Training of the horse starts on the ground, teaching him to lunge and to obey a command to walk, trot, or canter. First bareback, and later with a saddle. This also gets him accustomed to the creaking of the saddle and the pressure of the girth. Finally, after much testing of stepping in the stirrups and putting your weight on his back, you swing your leg over and the riding starts. In the meantime, you must enjoy them as frisky foals as the time passes quickly to when they reach full maturity and behave like full-grown horses that can be ridden with all their fiery spirit and pizzazz.